Welcome back to New Rockstars. I'm Eric Boss, and this is a breakdown of Civil War, the 2024 Alex Garland film from A24, set in a dystopian United States, mired in a civil war, told from the point of view of war journalists making their way to DC. I've loved Alex Garland's work from Ex Machina to Annihilation. In this film, Civil War could go down as one of the most controversial films of the year, and it's the kind of title that you're probably gonna hear some bad faith hot takes about. So I wanted to analyze this film with my background in journalism, because I think Civil War is not a story about politics or war, it's really a story about media coverage, not where we point our guns, but where we point our cameras. So in this video, I'm going to break down this movie scene by scene to reveal some deeper layers of meaning that you might have missed, some overlooked details, and what I think we're meant to take away from it. Thanks to Conflict of Nations for sponsoring this video. If you watched Civil War and couldn't quit thinking about deployment strategy and tactics, then Conflict of Nations is a game for you. Conflict of Nations is a free online PvP strategy game where you can take command of a nation as it marches into World War III. You can find up to 128 other players in games that take weeks to play out. Plus, Conflict of Nations is cross-platform, so you can play with everyone you know. Conflict of Nations currently features a 32-player scenario set on the North American continent, including California or Texas as playable nations, but also including surrounding countries such as Mexico and Canada. The map is designed to play out like a modern-day civil war in which many of the actual states existing in the present-day United States rally themselves into different factions and alliances and open war on each other just like in this movie. Just use the link in the description to get started with Conflict of Nations today and get an exclusive gift. Okay, the film opens with the unnamed President of the United States, played by Nick Offerman, who, after playing the libertarian hard-ass with the heart of gold Ron Swanson in Parks and Recreation, shifted to the dystopian survivalist with the heart of strawberries, Bill, in The Last of Us. This president rehearses for a televised speech, saying, we are now closer than we've ever been to victory. But then he, like, stops and resets as he wills himself from uncertainty to a more authoritative presidential tone. It reminds me of the opening speech rehearsals from Tilda Swinton's character and Michael Clayton, mixed with Michael Moore's opening montage of White House reporters and political figures prepping for their stand-ups in the 2004 documentary Fahrenheit 9-11. Cinematographer Rob Hardy shoots these shots in handheld, extreme close-ups out of focus from the side. Like, it's kind of hard to get a clear frame of the president, and it's hard to know if he's even still alive, because the whole objective of the protagonist of the story is to just get a clearly framed shot of the president, and a quote from him. Alex Garland intercuts the president's rehearsals with shots of real-world protests and riots, as if these images are haunting the president's mind as he knows that his days are numbered. But we see the polished, finished product of this speech televised and watched by Lee Smith, Kirsten Dunst, in her New York hotel room, and as she looks out the window, reflected in the glass is a map of this dystopian America rattling from the delayed boom of an explosion, which is a nice way of showing how backwards and literally shaken America is currently in this reality. So I love analyzing fictional dystopian maps from The Handmaid's Tale, The Hunger Games, The Man in the High Castle, electoral maps from the West Wing and succession, and after looking at all those, I admit this one is a stretch. California and Texas have entered into an alliance that's referred to as the Western Forces, or WF. Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Utah, Montana, Wyoming, and the Dakotas, and Minnesota are in another category that some maps have called the Western Forces, implying an alliance with California and Texas, but other maps are calling the New People's Army faction that's referred to by Joel in this movie as Portland Maoists, which seems like a reference to the New People's Army in the Philippines in the 1990s, which is where Alex Garland spent some time in his youth. Meanwhile, the Southeastern states have entered into the Florida Alliance, which is its own thing. And I would expect nothing less from my home state. And the president declares that the Florida Alliance recently failed to recruit the Carolinas. And then all the other states not mentioned are part of the loyalist union states still supporting President Nick Offerman's government in DC. And yes, there are truly very few plausible scenarios where Texas would ever politically align with California, at least in a way in which Nevada and Arizona would side with DC over them. Texas was its own republic before it was a state, thus the Lone Star flag design that we see in this movie, but they would never let California be the other star on that flag. Now, you could say California and Texas are both border states, must be an immigration issue, right? But immigration is a way bigger issue in Arizona, and Arizona in this movie is a loyalist state. The movie doesn't really get into it, and really, it just seems like President Nick Offerman is just a polarizing, despotic leader, perhaps from the Midwest. I might just be getting that, though, from Ron Swanson being an Indiana guy and Nick Offerman himself coming from Illinois. Sammy later says that the president disbanded the FBI and ordered airstrikes on American citizens, but they don't say which American citizens, and that this president is now in a third term that he has declared for himself. It kind of just seems like the totality of these decisions pissed off people everywhere in the United States, and particularly the states of California and Texas were like, you know what, we could hold our own with our own agriculture, our own big populations and geographic isolation and energy grids and economies and international relations, and they ended up like forging side alliances with China and secured protections from China from the Portland Maoists of the New People's Army. And that could be why Jesse Plemons' character later was so anti-China. Now, in reality, presidents are only constitutionally allowed 
allowed to serve two terms, which would mean that there would have to be some kind of constitutional crisis in which the president just ignored or suspended the 22nd Amendment that dictates presidents can only serve two terms, as well as the 25th Amendment that dictates presidential succession. Constitutional experts have gamed out some nightmare scenarios where this could happen, but essentially the president would have to declare like martial law, saying that the country as a whole is in some kind of crisis. And then with the backing of the military and potentially the Supreme Court and other factions of the federal government, decide to suspend the constitution temporarily and then go into full dictator mode while claiming moral authority. In this movie, outlets like Reuters and the New York Times still exist, but the union forces shoot press on site. And it seems like the press has a friendlier relationship with the Western forces. For what it's worth, when discussing film asked Alex Garland why Texas, a state with historic conservative politics that have only gone further and further to the right in recent years, would ever unite with California, a state that has only moved further and further to the left, here's what he had to say. There is a fascist president. The president is killing their own citizens. Then what's happened is two states who are in different uh, political positions are saying we are more concerned about a fascist constitution smashing violent president. We are more concerned about that than we are about our political differences. And then there's a counter to that, which is if you cannot conceptualize that polarized politics could be overcome in order to combat a fascist president, what is that saying about the nature of polarized politics? So the film is, is about journalists doing old fashioned reporting I'm trying to echo that form of reporting and I would be breaking that form of reporting if I started throwing bias all over it and on top of that would be dismantling the argument within the film which is that polarization is not a good thing. And I get that, but then why would all these other states, Colorado, New York, Michigan, Illinois, Tennessee, Massachusetts, Missouri, Arizona, New Mexico, not object to this horrible fascist president? Why would it just be Texas and California? I think we just have to acknowledge that this is a weird map that raises way too many questions that it doesn't sound like Alex Garland has answers to. I lead folks to just best appreciate this movie, don't focus on the political alignments or the issues at play, because Alex Garland seems to just be telling a story about how the media covers these events. It's the story of war journalist Lee from the older generation who feels some moral qualms about covering civil unrest to play into the narrative of either side, as well as the young firebrand of Jesse who wants to snap a great photo at any cost and insert herself and her fellow journalists into the lens of history. Thematically, this movie has less in common with the dystopian morality tale of V for Vendetta or even with grounded real world civil war point of view stories like Hotel Rwanda or Black Hawk Down than it does with Dan Gilroy's Nightcrawler, a movie that stars Jake Gyllenhaal as a sociopathic paparazzo who explores exploits the media craze of her crime in Los Angeles suburbs and crosses the lines of journalistic ethics, even sacrificing a fellow journalist just to get the perfect shot. That's really what this movie is. Kirsten Dunst told Games Radar that Alex Garland grew up as the son of a newspaper cartoonist, and I've worked for a newspaper before, and I can tell you that the cartoonists are often the ballsiest satirists on staff. And on the staff of the San Francisco Chronicle in the late 60s, cartoonist Robert Graysmith became the most aggressive investigator of the Zodiac Killer. And hey, that was another Jake Gyllenhaal role. Anyway, so Lee and Joel Wagnamura are journalists working for Reuters, covering of New Yorkers angrily demanding drinking water, suggesting the Western forces have succeeded by making life in Union states intolerable. A young, unaffiliated journalist, Jesse Paley Spaney, gets hurt, and Lee takes her aside for her safety and gives her this yellow press vest. And knowing where this story goes, this is a symbolic handoff from the vet to the young gun, giving the kid protection that Lee won't have in the final sequence. But a woman with an American flag is a suicide bomber blowing up this crowd, and at this point forward, there is no sound in the sequence, aside for two shutter clicks. One from Lee's camera as she takes takes a photo of the carnage, and then one from Jesse's camera as she takes a photo of Lee taking a photo. So already we are seeing Jesse's misunderstanding of who to point the camera at. Don't insert the journalist into the story, just tell the story as if the journalists are invisible. Really, Jesse just kind of worships photojournalism as like art or punk rock and not public service. We meet Sammy, a New York Times journalist played by Stephen McKinley Henderson, who played the Mentat, Thufir Hawat in Dune. He and Joel debate whether July 4th will be the invasion day, and Sammy calls it a race to Berlin between the Western forces and he says that there's no coordination and that they will turn on each other, referencing the Americans and the Soviets in April 1945, hitting Nazi Germany from the Eastern and Western fronts. Now, it's not clear if Sammy is referring to a race between Texas and California, or a race between the Western forces and the Florida Alliance, or if the New People's Army is also 
on this hunt. But either way, it's Alex Garland's way of just kind of hanging a lantern on the general uncertainty of this factionalized United States. This isn't really like a righteous revolution. It's just gonna be something that results in a much bigger mess and a bigger conflict on the other side of it. Lee and Joel's plan is to try to be at the White House to get a photo and an interview with the president at the moment of the surrender. Because it's been 14 months since he's given an interview. People don't even know if the speeches are pre-recorded or if he's even still alive or really what his status is. Sammy says he only wants a ride to Charlottesville, which they refer to as the front line. And this is likely a nod to Charlottesville, Virginia, being the site of the infamous 2017 white supremacist rally, followed by the counter protests the next day in which protesters were run down by a white nationalist, killing one protester and injuring 19 others, followed by our president at the time saying that there were very fine people on both sides. Now, Jesse tells Lee that she has the same name as Lee Miller, referring to the female war photographer who was the first into Dachau, referring to the concentration camp. In addition to Dachau, though, Lee Miller posed for a photograph by David E. Sherman of Life magazine, where she was in Hitler's apartment in Munich in his bathtub. Lee says that she knows who Lee Miller is. In this kind of tone, it suggests that she doesn't really approve of that former fashion model posing in a photo. And she isn't thrilled with someone who views Lee Miller, of all the photographers in history, as her particular hero. Though maybe it's a coincidence, but in the very next shot, we see of our Lee, she is in her bathtub. Lee flashes back to a horrifically violent past assignment, including other international places of civil unrest, and this man being lassoed up in a tire and lit on fire. She has seen how bad this can get, and she still seems in disbelief that it is happening here in America. So in Manhattan, the issues of the utility grid have resulted in fuck the WF tagged on a tower. There's no traffic in the city, probably because all travel by cars has been suspended after things like truck bombs, so now everyone has to travel on bikes. Now, some of the most impressive shots in this movie are just showing Manhattan empty. But Alex Garland got his start writing the screenplay for 28 Days Later, with this year's Oscar winner Killian Murphy walking through London that Danny Boyle miraculously convinced to clear out for a tiny amount of time on a Sunday morning at sunrise. So this is kind of a Alex Garland trademark. So the four of them head out, and we get this countdown giving us this movie's structure, 857 miles to DC. Now Washington DC is actually only 229 miles from Manhattan, but remember, we are taking the long way through central Pennsylvania and West Virginia, because it sounds like Philadelphia is just like a current war zone. They have to weave through these burned, shells of cars on the highway, and with Sammy earlier saying the highways were vaporized, this must be what he was talking about. It sounds like they were firebombed. They drive through this checkpoint, and notice how Union troops set up this checkpoint beside a power station with barbed wire fencing around it, making me wonder if they had to kind of double up staff on a location to keep Western forces from sabotaging the energy grid here in Pennsylvania. Then they pass a housing division where a peaceful home has been bombed. Yellow flags line this division, and I was wondering maybe this is an area that tried to stay neutral but got caught in the crossfire, or with the yellow flags were signaling allegiance to the Western forces and the president's forces just bombed this home. So they have to stop for gas, and Lee offers to pay these guys 300 Canadian, which the local militia dude accepts. And throughout this road trip movie, the scariest thing isn't like the Union forces or the Western forces. It's just like the militia that they meet along the way, and they don't really know who they're loyal to. Jesse had gotten a peek into the car wash earlier, so of course she's going to do the punk rock thing and chat up the local, and I'm guessing Lee saw them too and just knew that Jesse's curiosity would get the best of her. This younger militia guy, who we definitely see checking out Jesse, says that these two Two beaten up guys were looters, but can we really believe him? Lee diffuses the situation by asking the guy to stand with them. So she's separating the journalist from the subject and making this guy aware of himself and thus accountable. And unlike Jesse, Lee does not insert herself into this. So afterwards, as Jesse is mad at herself for not taking any photos, Lee snaps at her. Once you start asking yourself those questions, you can't stop. So we don't ask. We record so other people ask. Now, if more politically charged viewers feel frustrated watching this movie, I totally understand how you feel. But I think Alex Garland in this moment is using the character of Lee to instruct us, which he considers the Jessies of the world, saying that it's the role of the person holding the camera to frame the shot so that others ask the moral questions of whether or not this should have happened. We see more carnage of suburban areas as audio from the president's speeches about rejecting peace summits and pledging allegiance to the flag play. And you feel Lee and Joel's need to get a photo and interview with the president because, as far as everyone knows, we don't really know what his status is and we can't really trust these broadcasts. It is the kind of uncertainty that surrounded dictators like Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein when they were losing their grip on power. Lee has Jesse take photos of a crashed helicopter in this mall parking lot. Now, Jesse's uncertain because, you know, there's no corpse, there's no, like, active drama happening, but just the contrast of a crashed military craft in front of a JC Penny is shocking enough. And Jesse, noticed, finds a good shot on her own, an overturned shopping cart in the foreground. Sammy lectures Lee 
that she was like Jesse when she was at that age, saying, you say your heart on her, I say your heart on herself. And Lee responds, okay, writer. And I love that because it's such a photojournalist diss, like, oh, look at you trying to ascribe a caption to this moment. And this made me cringe a little less a moment later when Sammy says, State of the Union is QED. And QED stands for the Latin of Quad Erat Demonstrandum, or that which has been demonstrated, which is just a phrase that's used to indicate the end of an argument. And it's really just something the New York Times writer would write and his editor would say, oh, what are you trying to prove? You want to hearst at Northwestern? Go f*** off. Now, as a road trip story set in a war setting, I guess we can also liken this movie with Apocalypse Now. And as such, you need at least one of the Argonauts in the gang to be overly horny for action, which Joel totally is. It's that he is turned on by the firefight over the tree line. So the next day, the crew joins his firefight, which is on a college campus. Rebels in Hawaiian shirts fight with Union soldiers. And I may be wrong, but I think this might be the college campus that Joel later references to Jesse Plemons' character that they're trying to, like, reopen. Clearly, that is not happening, but these guys are wearing Hawaiian shirts, and you're just kind of wondering what their backstory is. One of these rebels gets shot, and he bleeds out, and Jesse snaps, 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 but Lee just stops. Maybe it's because Joel is in the background of the shot, scribbling in his notepad, and seeing press in the frame kind of takes you out of it, but later she admits it's a good shot because the drama is just so powerful, it trumps the technical flaw of Joel being in it. As they follow the rebels upstairs, there's this moment where this one signals to the others to hold back, and Lee just knows from the hand signals alone to lower her camera and pause, because she's been in war zones before. Whereas you'll notice throughout this movie, Jesse always has to be leashed back after trying to rush ahead directly into the fire in this movie. And that ends up playing a very, very big role in the final act in the White House. And after watching these guys brutally execute a wounded Union soldier, and as they unload on the other four outside, Joel laughs it up with the leader of this group. And we see that this is how he gets stories, but it's also just how desensitized he is to the sadism on either side of this conflict. So we're now 289 miles to DC, and they pull up to a West Virginia refugee camp in this football stadium. And Jesse shows Lee her photo developing travel kit using an app on her phone, despite it not having a signal, and using her body temperature to warm the developing solution. And here's one contrast where Jesse, as a younger, tech-savvier Gen Zer, has over the millennial Lee. Like, remember, Lee could not file her photos because the hotel Wi-Fi sucked, whereas Jesse has a practical workaround showing how she doesn't really even need Wi-Fi. Jesse gives us some of Lee's backstory, saying that she saw on her Wikipedia page that she took the legendary Antifa massacre photo when she was in college. Now, to me, this is really the heaviest world-building detail in the script, because Lee must be in her 40s, maybe late 30s at her youngest. And in our reality, we have not had an Antifa massacre in our history, thank God. And just to be clear my politics, I don't think massacres of any rioters anywhere is ever justified. So this is a world where an Antifa massacre has happened 15 years at least prior. It must be set on a timeline where the government oppression and war crimes began long before, even prior to President Nick Offerman's third term. So it wasn't just this president. Things were getting shitty during his predecessor's term as well. So they continue on and we go under an overpass where Ghost Steelers is written over two hanging corpses. Honestly, this might have just been some Steelers fans doing this to some Browns fans before the Civil War broke out. And then they drive through this town where everything seems peaceful and they head into this boutique. I you guys aware there's like a pretty huge Civil War going on all across America. We just try to stay out. And this is kind of like a prototypical step on any road trip movie as we go into a heart of darkness. There's always like one breather where everything seems to be fine, but it's actually kind of like the creepiest stop on the journey. There's this quiet moment where Lee tries on a green dress and Jesse goads her into posing for a photo and she tricks Lee into laughing to get her to smile. I believe this foreshadows the moment Jesse exploits the moment of Lee's death by taking a photo. But Sammy realizes this peaceful place is actually just secured by gunmen creeping on every rooftop. Joel wonders what he'd say if he got a microphone on the president and Sam says that dictators like Gaddafi, Mussolini, and Cochescu, who was the Romanian dictator from the 60s through the 80s, are all lesser men than you think and are going to end up disappointing you, which, of course, this president ends up doing to Sammy in the final line. Then they drive up on this creepy winter wonderland, which is a scene that Alex Garland broke down for the New York Times, saying that the production actually found an unattended holiday drive through display just like this when they were filming in Georgia, but they get shot at by a sniper in the building and join these two pinned Union soldiers who are frozen in place waiting for a clear shot. Notice that these guys have painted hair and a bright finger nail polish, suggesting to me that these guys have just been on their own for a while and are honestly just bored. Joel's colleagues Tony and Bohai to catch up to them, and Jesse wants to play Daredevil 2, so she swaps into Bohai's car. Tony is played by Nelson Lee, who in the past year played New Republic Senator Hamato Ziono for Star Wars Ahsoka. A military truck nearly runs Lee off the road, and knowing where it came from and that this is a truck, this thing likely had bodies in it or just dropped them off in this open grave that they stumble upon next. Which brings us to the most chilling scene of the film. Jesse Plemons plays an unnamed soldier sprinkling live on a mass 
grave. This character doesn't wear any flag insignia, which makes it super precarious for Joel to know how to even approach him or know what to say or what not to say. Who knows what his allegiances are? His only flair is his pair of red sunglasses, which is interesting because it would mean that everywhere he looks, he sees red. This guy is just on a hair trigger. Plemons, interestingly, is not credited for this film. Apparently, there was another actor in this role. He dropped out last minute, and Kirsten Dunst, who's married to Jesse Plemons in real life after they met working on Fargo season two, asked him he was free. Yet, I think it was hilarious that A24 still put Jesse Plemons in pretty much every trailer and promo for this movie. Alex Garland and cinematographer Rob Hardy shot this scene so that no cameras would be visible to the actors, and that they could just live in the fear of the role that Jesse Plemons was playing. And they said that Jesse Plemons wasn't even joining them before they started shooting. He just walked into the scene and was already the psychopathic character. The DP, Hardy, hid in a mass grave pit, looking up at the actors from below. And think about it, that would be the one angle that they would not want to look at in the scene. But also hanging over this all was this one corpse stuck on the truck bed from his leg. So even if Joel and Lee and Tony don't look down at the grave and they just keep their eyes on the soldier, right behind him would be another possible fate for themselves. Now, Joel and Plymouth's character have this exchange. Well, you're American, okay? Okay. What kind of American are you? And then Plemons' character adds Central American, South American, and Joel says that he's from Florida, and the soldier says, oh, so Central. So yes, this soldier is racially profiling Joel, and he believes that the Florida alliance with, I suppose, a Central American immigrant population in South Florida makes it not his America. But it just shows how delusional he is. Like, Florida's got a mix of all kinds of people who live there. And the fact that they're in alliance with, like, Georgia and Alabama and Louisiana means that the Florida alliance is about way bigger things than just being, like, Central American. Meanwhile, Jesse tells this guy that she's from Missouri, which he's says it's a show me state but jesse doesn't know why it's called that the show me state is on missouri license plates which i assume is where this guy knew that from but it supposedly comes from a speech by congressman willard vandiver in 1899 who came underdressed to a fancy philadelphia dinner and said quote i come from a state that raises corn and cotton goggle burrs and democrats and frothy eloquence neither convinces me nor satisfies me i'm from missouri and you have got to show me this might be apocryphal but it's really just part of the reputation of missourians for being skeptical and not easily convinced which ironically is the posture of this soldier as he's interrogating all of them. Lee, meanwhile, says that she's from Colorado, which, along with Missouri, is a Union state, but really just seems like this soldier is motivated by ultra-nationalism. And within a collapsing Union army, he just kind of formed his own cultish order where they just started killing people randomly. But after Bohai got shot, Tony is terrified as he tells him he's from Hong Kong, and this soldier immediately identifies Hong Kong as China and murders him. And then everything just goes to shit, and Joel looks like he's gonna be next, but Sammy plows into Jesse Plemons' character with the car, and he bumps into Jesse. They both go into the open grave pit, and just her skin touching that powdered lye on the bodies would severely burn her. And she ends up vomiting in the car later. We learn that Sammy has taken a bullet and they have to transfer him to the back seat. He was the one who knew that going downhill would mean certain death. And he's the one who knew he'd never make it to DC. And so we see this oldest generation reporter trading his life for Jesse's. And it makes us feel so bad for the way she uses that gift in the final act of this movie. We get this surreal sequence where they're driving through a forest fire as the embers shower the car. And it's kind of beautiful because normally driving through a forest fire is like driving through hell. It's terrifying. But for Sammy, this is just like a natural beauty that allows him to escape the man-made nightmare that they've been driving through before this. They end up making it to the frontline base of the Western forces in Charlottesville, where with fighter jets and helicopters, they are ready for an invasion of DC. Lee has his photo of Sammy dead in the back seat, but she decides to delete it as a photo of a dead news colleague for her is not worth keeping. And again, we'll see how that contrasts Jesse's philosophy in the final act. Anya and Dave, reporters embedded with the WF, say that the government military forces surrendered, leaving only secret service and a few do or die soldiers to protect the White House. Which is just interesting because the Secret Service derives its authority from Congress so if like Congress had already surrendered, the Secret Service would have no reason to protect the President. But this just tells us how far things have gone. Like he's convinced the Secret Service to be like his personal bodyguards. Anya is played by Sonia Mizuno who has appeared in all of Alex Garland's films. And if this scene with Lee and Jesse by the lake reminds you of the location where the Avengers mourn Natasha in Avengers Endgame, both movies were shot in the same part of Georgia so there's a good chance that it's the same lake or one nearby. And at last we arrive to Washington DC. Western forces fight Union soldiers at the Lincoln Memorial. And while it's unlikely neither side would want to bomb a precious landmark, it does make sense for Union loyalists to use these monuments as shields, hoping to keep the rebels from engaging them there. But the Western forces don't care. They destroy it with RPGs, which in this movie is an unsubtle mark of the downfall of our remembrance of the president who presided over the last Civil War. Anytime I visited DC, one of my favorite things about the National Mall is the way that its architects designed it based on line of sight. So the Lincoln Memorial, the Washington Monument, and the Capitol Dome form a straight line. And if you look west 
from the Lincoln Memorial, you get a view of the bridge over the Potomac, and at night, you can see directly the eternal flame at Arlington National Cemetery, which was the former home of Robert E. Lee. So, by destroying the Lincoln Memorial, we're really destroying the architectural nexus point and the peace that ended the Civil War in 1865. Joel, Jesse, and Lee follow the Western forces up the D.C. streets, where a two-story perimeter wall has been raised around the White House. For Lee, the violence becomes overwhelming, and I'm wondering if the Western forces soldier who caught fire from the Union RPG might have triggered her memory from her flashback earlier. Joel asks the other reporter, Dave, what shot he got, and Dave brags about a shot of a chopper leaving the roof of the Pentagon, which I assume might have been the Defense Secretary or some of the Joint Chiefs, but either way, it's likely a historical parallel to the chopper from the roof of the American Embassy during the fall of Saigon during the Vietnam conflict. The President's motorcade and armored limo charge out, and Lee, not having her camera raised for that moment, just eyeballs the passengers of the limo to know that POTUS is not inside. So it looks like the President sent out some advisors, maybe his chief of staff, or maybe even his wife, as a decoy. Yikes. So Joel, Lee, and Jesse, with a group of Western forces, creep up to the White House, and it's just surreal to see. And like, kind of triggering for Americans, to be honest. But I think this is all meant to be like allied forces finding Hitler's bunker, because they go through this ground level room where there's all this like crap and takeout food cartons just everywhere. And they make it to the press briefing room where advisor Joy Butler, played by Wani Feliz, is sent out to negotiate a surrender for the president. And she requests to be taken to a neutral territory like Greenland or Alaska. So they shoot this woman and they move in closer toward the Oval Office. And we see how many of Jesse's photos include Lee and Joel in frame. Like she's with friends trying to document a road trip. Lee hangs back and knows only to cross the hall while the Western forces are laying suppressive fire. But Jesse doesn't know to do that. So she heads right into the open with no cover and Lee saves her life by pushing her down. But Jesse sociopathically sees only a great photo opportunity, takes her shot and the way Garland frames it, it looks as though Jesse with her camera is the one who fired the killing shot on Lee. Now, if there's any confusion over whether Lee was killed by Union loyalist fire or by friendly fire from the Western forces, Kirsten Dunst cleared it up with Variety that the bullets were definitely fired from the president's Oval Office. She said, quote, what happened was that I know when to cross and when not to cross with the soldiers when they fire. I know the signals and how to read them. You just know when it's time to move and when it's time not to. That's something that Kaylee's character, Jesse, obviously does not know. Kaylee Spaney said that all the still photos that you see in this movie from Jesse's camera during the sequence, she actually shot herself. So the chaos of all these moments and the unrefined composition, it was all by design. They wanted to feel like it was coming from an amateur citizen journalist, perhaps to feel like our footage of January 6th inside the Capitol being found on social media accounts of the trespassers themselves. Jesse and even Joel take hardly any time to mourn Lee, and they follow the Western forces directly into the Oval Office, where they drag out the president from behind the resolute desk, and Joel demands a quote from this beleaguered president, and all he says is, don't let them kill me. And Joel says, yeah, that'll do. And so Jesse raises her camera and gets the money shot at the moment they shoot the president. And the screen flashes white as Jesse's photo develops, slowly fading into view over the credits. And the final shot kind of looks like the photo of the soldiers posing with the president's corpse, like a prized fish, or maybe even the infamous Abu Ghraib photos. We're not meant to feel like this is a victory here. The music over the closing credits is a 1979 track, Dream Baby Dream, by the electro-punk band Suicide. Now, I hate to even mention this, but we gotta talk about it. In the credits, this film lists among its sources of archival footage, Andy no. So Andy No is a controversial right-wing provocateur known for misleading reporting and highly unethical anti-journalistic tactics. I assume some of the opening minutes shots of real-world Antifa footage might have come from him. Now, just because No was credited doesn't mean that he was paid for this footage, as his footage might have fallen under fair use and then the production would not have to pay him, but they would still feel obligated to credit him. Folks, we don't really know. Ultimately, though, we have to ask, did Alex Garland have to use him as a source? Now, some could point to the fact that Stanley Kubrick in the montage footage for A Clockwork Orange used footage from Lenny Riefenstahl, a Nazi filmmaker. So really the context of the moment matters. And you could argue that Alex Garland was just using that footage to transform it into this broader art piece that criticizes citizen journalism like this. But you know, in Stanley Kubrick's case, it was Nazi Germany. All they really had were Nazi filmmakers. They didn't have like agencies like Reuters or AP who were there recording as well. All he really had was the people who were there. Whereas in this case, A24 and Alex Garland had a ton of different options to source footage from, and they still pick this guy. Now I'm getting into my personal take here, so feel free to stop watching it if you don't want my personal opinions. I still appreciate you watching this far. Have a great day. But I got a soapbox here for a moment. My feelings on this movie are complicated. I ultimately liked this movie. It was well shot, it was well acted, I'll even say it was well structured and well written, but it was in desperate need of context. Alex Garland made the decision to avoid politics and just focus on the journalists, which, okay, that's fine. But journalists are political beings, and these 
these journalists would know and would mention at some point the issues that led to this civil war that has now taken over their lives. Like, you wouldn't make a movie set during the U.S. Civil War in the 1860s and leave the viewer uncertain if slavery was at the root of this conflict. I understand not wanting the script to be a political lecture or like an exposition dump, but all we would need is one line. Like, think about it. George Miller's Mad Max Fury Road, dystopian movie, right? It opens with voiceover about oil wars and then it moves on. It doesn't burden us with it for the rest of the movie. Bong Joon-ho's Snowpiercer, another dystopian post-apocalyptic movie, opens with sound bites of climate change and even has footage of Obama in that and then just moves on. Handmaid's Tale, Children of Men, both great dystopian stories that both started with fertility crises. Even Alex Garland's script for 28 Days Later hints at Ebola in the opening minutes to explain how this zombie outbreak was possible. I'm just saying that in like President Nick Offerman's opening speech, there could have been something like neutralizing the riots in Austin and San Francisco were necessary to secure this nation. You know, just something like that to explain how Texas and California would ever join forces. Instead, all we get in this film are references to an Antifa massacre that logically would have had to happen before President Nick Offerman came into office anyway, or references to airstrikes on US citizens without saying which citizens, or just giving us this weird map without explaining why Texas would ever join a secession faction with California, but not with Florida. And these little details are just not enough context for us to learn anything from this story about journalists debating where to point their cameras. You could say maybe that's not Alex Garland's job to provide that context. But you know what? He titled his movie Civil War and he released it during an election year. And I just think there's a responsibility that comes with that. At the very least, to clarify to your viewer whether your dystopia is beyond redemption or worth fighting for. Like something as basic as that should not be left open for interpretation. But at the end of the day, I still really appreciate this movie and I will watch anything Alex Garland makes, even if he's taking a break from directing to go back to just writing screenplays, because he's clearly a very talented guy. But I want to hear your thoughts on this film. Then again, I'm also kind of terrified to hear some of your thoughts on this film. So I'm just going to ask you, please don't be an asshole in the comments below. So that was a lot to break down from the movie, but Conflict of Nations is a free online PvP strategy game happening in modern global warfare where you can strategize on a global and local scale. Choose your strategy, engage in epic battles, and take over the world or reunite the split states of America to former glory. Click on the link in the description to get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free, but this offer is only available for 30 days, so click now. Follow all three channels on the New Rockstars Network. Follow me at EA Boss. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.